and ways to uh, diagnose new infections in a cheaper manner. Then I moved on to studying animal behavior, and uh, what I did was to develop assays that can be used to study learning and memory in transfusion animals. And when I did it, long time back, you can go eight years ago, old I am, 17 years ago when I started doing that, uh, that was with an idea that one day there will be ways that one can image the whole nervous system between small animals. And that day has indeed arrived. The idea was you can figure out what goes behind, what computation goes behind in learning and memory. So from there I moved on to studying to studying electrical currents. Uh, to studying electrical currents in neurons, how they communicate. Uh, and then I moved on to synthesize all this information to do drug discovery. And you say there is no artificial intelligence in that journey. When I started doing that, I realized that I cannot make sense of vast amount of data without there being artificial intelligence. Standard mathematical tools, standard human processing was simply not enough. So that was my introduction to artificial intelligence. Now, what I do with artificial intelligence is twofold. One, I'm just simply a consumer of technology. I apply it to study biomedical problems. For example, my group is fascinated by the spread of HIV and how again it's catching up in some areas and what can we do to stop it. So we are interested in finding out the gap between awareness and the actual spread. And what we are doing is simply looking at newspaper articles about different parts of the world. And once you get that information by scraping the web, why artificial intelligence becomes important is because manually you can't do the job, you can't classify say 300,000 articles to figure out what the awareness is. So you manually classify 1,000 articles, give the categories, and train a neural network. So now you train an artificial intelligence to do the job for you. Now similarly, I do that for drug discovery. So that's sort of one end as a consumer. But having been fortunate, it was not even by design, having been fortunate to be a neuroscientist in a way that I stumbled on neuroscience after my bachelor's, uh, and uh, honestly, my first love of life was uh, evolution. And I ended up going to study brain and realized that this is the most interesting problem. So, but that has led me to an interesting approach to artificial intelligence. So what else I do is try to make artificial intelligence more neuromorphic. For example, right now all aspects of artificial intelligence, uh, whether they are inspired by brain and some which are not, they're all still relying on models of changing connection strengths. So they're playing with architecture beautifully. For example, you have artificial neural networks. As the name indicates, they were uh, inspired by how neurons are connected in brain. You have backpropagating models. You have convolutional neural networks. So these are all neural networks, but they are relying on changes in what would be brain equivalent of synaptic plasticity. Brain uses lot more plasticity mechanisms which are not being utilized. And what my team is trying to do is to make super specialized, super smart AI that in the same amount of architecture you're spending, the AI has 1,000 or 10,000 more times more learning capability. So it becomes more efficient by becoming more brain-like. So it doesn't simply rely on brain plus, uh, in on synaptic plasticity, it starts relying on other aspects. For example, nodal plasticity, for example, sprouting new connections. For example, having delay in conduction. So, there are two aspects, and that's the beauty of studying two different fields, and that's something also I want to sort of impress on young students, young minds, even young entrepreneurs, that if you don't limit yourself to one field, this cross-connection enables you to do things very differently than most other people can. So that's sort of my journey into artificial intelligence. Now you might say, okay, interesting journey, why should we care? At least if somebody else was talking about their journey, uh, Honestly, in most cases, I would have been uh, sort of, you know, tuned out. I would have said, okay, there are a lot of people who have interesting journey, but uh, you should care about because artificial intelligence is everywhere. Most of you might say, oh, it's something in science fiction movies. But I'd like to ask you, how many of you have taken a flight? You've flown in an airplane, most of you. That means uh, that except for the takeoff and landing, most of what was being done was by artificial intelligence. A human's pilot role in most of the flights is rather minimal nowadays. So you rely on artificial intelligence too. You've trusted your life on artificial intelligence. Many of you have a smartphone. In that smartphone, if you are uh, saying something that voice recognition technology is artificial intelligence, most of you are on social media. 
the feed that you get is based on artificial intelligence, which feeds of your friends you see. In fact, your feed is not perfect. It tells you what is all wrong with artificial intelligence also, just like any technology, it has a lot of problems. So you see select feeds. When you're navigating, when you look up map, it is dynamically showing you where there is traffic, what route to take. It's based on rather interesting artificial intelligence. It's based on a very complex problems that humans would have very tough time solving. What is the optimal route to take in traffic? That's all through artificial intelligence. So artificial intelligence is everywhere. Okay? Now, artificial intelligence has a great potential, like all new technology. And most people who talk about future of any technology are either the technologists, engineers, scientists, or visionaries. What they frequently don't take into account is the fact that technology and its utilization depends on people, it depends on the kind of society we live in. For example, the power of atom can be used to create electricity uh, in a thermonuclear power plant. Also, it can be used to create an atom bomb. So it depends on the kind of society we live in. Artificial intelligence, for example, let us take a journey just six months to five years down the line, not very far. Most of your vehicles will be driven by that. Vehicles are already being driven, they're self-driven cars. Now there's a lot of noise that, okay, they're self-driven cars are problematic because there have been some accidents. Well, is that the benchmark of zero accidents or the benchmark is compared to humans, how many accidents are happening? Actually a lot less. So there are, uh, so autonomous vehicles are much better than human drivers. Okay, now, there will be applications in agriculture. Right now, we have the problem of our crops growing really fast, with lots of carbon dioxide in the air, then being fed pesticides, weedicides, other things. Imagine small robots taking care of bugs, killing them. Imagine crops being cultivated in a more environment which is, let's say, carbon dioxide less, in a more, they end up being more nutritious, they provide you more micronutrients. Imagine all the repetitive tasks, let's say 15 to 20 years from now, all the human drudgery, most of the repetitive tasks being taken away, not just let's say very time consuming agricultural sector, most 90% of jobs being given to robots. Imagine a society where most of the repetitive industrial tasks are taken over by artificial intelligence in form of physical manifestation of robots. It can lead to two things. It could lead to super rich who might control all the artificial intelligence asking why do we need poor. Now you can rely on their mercy because when the standard several psychological studies show, people prefer to be slightly poor as long as they're richer to others. So they want poorer people with them. Uh, alternatively, uh, you can live in a society which is more egalitarian, where we end up as a humankind, as one, where artificial intelligence serves as our servant, where human beings don't have to work because they have to earn their living. Several countries are already talking about universal basic income because of other reasons, but artificial intelligence, if the society is such that we are living in a more egalitarian society, we can, it can provide for the basics of almost all human beings. And we can be free to do what we are best at, creative work, rather than repetitive, boring tasks, something that we are actually very horrible at. So, <coughs> while this... found a way to stop that, at least. So what is, uh, uh, what is uh, the direction uh, artificial intelligence would take? It actually has some interesting problems. Because it's not just any technology like atom bomb, right? An atom bomb does, doesn't decide to go on, on its own. It doesn't have a mind of its own. So right now, when we talk, think of AI, most of us think of Terminator, right? Because the movie's depiction. Uh, the society coming to an end because of artificial intelligence deciding to kill us. Now obviously that seems very far-fetched scenario, but there have been concerns way before any kind of artificial intelligence was out there. Uh, in fact, these concerns can be as, as old as Sir Isaac Asimov's three principles of robots. Now recently, uh, Elon Musk came up with three principles and Satya Nadella came up with his own list, and these are all very important things. Uh, why these lists were required is also important because gradually we are recognizing that we have technology which can be very, very powerful. Now, the ethical concern in AI, which is different than the regular ethical concern with any technology, is that can you have a pet which one day is more powerful, more, 
one day more smarter, one day smarter than you? Uh, I would not think so, right? You can pet, have a pet elephant, but it's unlikely that an elephant would have a human pet. So if artificial intelligence becomes smarter than you, if it does become sentient, why would it obey you? Unless its interests are aligned with you. Now some technologists, some wisdom argue that our interests would be aligned and we need to develop ourselves in the technology in a manner that our interests are bound to be aligned, there cannot be any contradiction. I see that as a difficult route. And that's my personal opinion, right? But there is another uh, problem also, not just of technology having its own mind. The problem is, be careful what you wish for. Now, this is also an interesting paradox that has been raised by others. Let us say you want your robot, your machine, to fetch a coffee across the street. And it's been given strict command. The owner is angry. He wants coffee to calm down right now. Uh, it steps out in ideal condition, just crosses the road and fetches the coffee. In another condition, it sees traffic jam, it sees a bunch of people around, decides to take out its guns, if it has guns, because the owner has asked for coffee. And these people are on the way, right? So if it is not filled with the ethical uh, principles that it should not kill others to just to fetch coffee for owner, so that's a problem. So there's a classic story of Midas, right? Midas asked, this wish that whatever he touches turns into gold. So he touched his daughter that turned into gold, he touched his food turned into gold. So he got his wish, but it is important that you have to be careful what you wish for. So it's not just AI acquiring a mind of its own. So there have been several concerns, but these are more sort of uh, like for long run, more sort of science fiction as of now. Uh, there are two aspects I like to talk about it. One is the important fact that if there is technology which is already meeting a chess player, which is already driving cars, which is already playing Go, uh, reaching the technology which reaches intelligence of a mouse navigating a complex maze uh, is not very far then. And the journey from playing chess to mouse is longer than from a mouse to chimpanzee. And the chimpanzee to human journey is not a very long journey. So we like to think of ourselves as very special. In fact, artificial intelligence would make us even more humble as the computer technology is growing, we are realizing how we are not as special as we like to think of ourselves. And also, there is a limitation of our smartness. Our brains are in a small cranium, our craniums are bigger than most animals, but a computer, which could be spread out in several rooms, several processes, if it is connected through, let's say, uh, entire web, it can have unlimited computation compared to us. Obviously, nothing is unlimited, but compared to where our computation powers rely, are there, that computation can be unlimited. So we're dealing with technology that could be very immense. So that is a future possibility. So that's one danger. So we should not think of it as a, just a science fiction scenario that we'll deal with it in 200 years. We might have to deal with such a problem in 15 years or 20 years. So it's not 200 years away. So that's one thing. The second thing, which is more immediate, what is already happening? Let me ask you, how many of you control your social media to do what you want? Okay? But how many, in how many cases is social media controlling you? So when you even talk to your friend, let's say you're involved in some chat, a personal messenger chat, don't you start seeing ads. Let's say I message my friend that I've got two kittens and I'm planning to buy a leash suddenly. I can do a Google search. But I'm not necessarily the customer, I'm also the product for social media companies. They are selling my information, which is being processed by AI. They also do not know what exactly their AI is picking up. Because it's important, see the regular programming has a variable. AI doesn't have a variable, right? It has various nodes which are undergoing changes, which you don't know. It only has an end goal. So in that scenario, you are the product, so you don't know what information is going out. And that's why Elon Musk raised important issues, and uh, they were followed by certain Adela's uh, points also, on how our information, how our privacy should be respected, which is currently not being respected, whether it's by governments or whether it's by large corporations, that whatever we are searching, that information is being sold out, and then you get suggestions. You search something on net, suddenly you start getting suggestions similar to that. So your information is out there. On the other hand, it's not as simple, right? It's very easy to sort of make villains of some uh, in big corporations and say these guys are doing that. 
would you like to pay for your social media? Would you like to pay for your Google search or Bing search? So where are they generating their revenues is also coming from this. So it's not simple um, process, it's not simple. So we are both the customers and the product for a lot of social media and the artificial intelligence there is processing our information. So it becomes very vital in this day and age that immediate rules and regulations are put into place. I'll tell you some things because that's not necessarily uh, what has made most people concerned. Most people know that these can be uh, sort of tackled at different levels. Different countries can tackle them differently. It depends on will of people. It depends on how active citizens are. But the f future scenario of artificial intelligence becoming so strong that it becomes out of our control, I would like to offer two, three solutions to it. And uh, mind you, whatever I'm saying, I believe there's a very small drop in the large ocean that needs to be filled before we can start really tackling this technology. Because uh, like any researcher, my understanding of it is limited to certain aspects. So I had an interesting discussion with a top data scientist of mine, Ishan Goyal. And what Ishan and I were initially talking about is can we just have a switch off, right? Power off button. And we realized that enough people have talked about it because uh, immediately when you think of a power off button, what happens is won't the AI be smart if it is make if it eventually becomes sentient to turn off its power button and disables the power button. So can we think of an alternative route? An alternative route would be about making AI into super specialist AI. So that what is the human strength, it never requires that. Human strength is general intelligence. It's not that we are best chess players. AI has already beaten to us, uh, uh, us to it. We are not the best go players. We are not the best drivers. We are certainly not the best mathematicians. We are very poor mathematicians. We just slightly above in our mathematical abilities than even some uh, other organisms. Even crows can count and do some basic arithmetic operations. So what humans have special is our general intelligence. So if you prevent AI from ever having general intelligence, and that is that always have super specialized AI which does not have, this is an important point, does not have communication of channels with each other. So segregate AI. That's physically possible. We would like to have imagine a world where defense does not get to own AI, but that's already happening. The biggest investors in artificial intelligence are defense companies. So we don't want to offer solutions. I don't want to say things which will only work in an ideal environment. I want to offer solutions which will work in the current world which we are living in. And to me, keeping artificial intelligence specialized and keeping it from communicating with each other are two important ways. And last but not least, there is another important thing that I'd like to sort of leave in. What happens with artificial intelligence? It requires our biases because it's learning from our set. For example, chatbots recently which were launched online, they became racist because they were learning from human patterns. When search engines suggest jobs, they were suggesting women with same academic qualifications lesser jobs. Because hiring managers are biased, and generally men are offered more jobs. So they acquired the same human biases. So what is the way around it? So the last solution is comes from an interesting thing of the game Go. So in this case, what happened is artificial intelligence started playing against each other based on the rules rather than learning from human moves. So learning from rules is a very good way that artificial intelligence can be made unbiased. Imagine a system where, let's say, instead of judiciary, where judges are biased to some ethnic group or another. Imagine some roles of uh, police cops where the cops are biased to some ethnic groups or some economic groups. Imagine some of the roles being taken up by artificial intelligence which is taught on rules. Rules that we as a society agree to. That can actually help make even society better. That can also make artificial intelligence better rather than learning from human experiences. We are not the most pleasant species. We are not the most honest species. So instead of learning from our experiences, when we collectively decide what is good, learning from those rules is possible. And I think that is where artificial intelligence can also be made safer for us. So let me recap. One, let us make artificial intelligence super specialized. Let us prevent it from talking to each other. And third, let it learn from rules that we craft for it. And towards that goal, an ocean of work is required. And obviously, what we are doing is very less, but uh, my group is interested in making artificial intelligence more competent, more specialized by making it more brain-like. 
in its specialized roles, not in generic roles. And that's what we are trying to do, is to make specialized AI. I hope that leads to a better society. And I hope most of you youngsters end up joining this thing and doing better than what we are able to do to create a better society, to create a safer artificial intelligence. Thank you.